welcome to my guests, Stephanie and Mario Caballero from Extraordinary Conceptions. How are you both today? We're good. How are you? Very well, yes, thank you. I'm excited to be discussing everything to do with this incredible agency that you have founded um, and to hear more about surrogacy and egg donation in North America and also how you're making it more affordable and more accessible all over the world. Um, and for those of people who are watching, um, I'd like them to hear from you about your personal struggle and journey to have your children um, and what inspired you to create Extraordinary Conceptions. Um, well, we also created the, sur I, I actually also created the Surrogacy Law Center at the same time um, as Extraordinary Conceptions, but you're absolutely right, Eloise. Um, we had a really long struggle. It uh, took us nearly eight years to have our children, um, 13 IVF procedures, um, miscarriages, surgeries. And even before that, um, I was doing, you know, our insemination procedures with my OBGYN, you know, rushing out at 10 o'clock to have an ultrasound and then getting the phone call back from my office and know you have to come back again at 2 p.m. And it was really, really stressful. Um, you know, and then all my friends and neighbors were having babies at the same time. So... Um, because of that, um, you know, we had an amazing woman carry our children, um, you know, God bless her. Um, and we've got, I think you can see the back, the pictures on Mario's wall. Um, so, you know, it was definitely something that I felt very strongly and passionately about. And we want to help as many people as possible experience the joy of having children like we do. Absolutely, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And at what point during this eight-year struggle did you decide to use a surrogate? Well, <laughs> my doctor actually uh, recommended it to us, but it took me three years to come to terms with, um, you know, because you have to give up mm -hmm. as a woman um, the fact that you aren't going to be carrying your child. You're not going to be sharing that within your marriage. Um, and so that it, it takes every woman, no matter you know the circumstances, it takes time for them to grieve for that, and that's what I needed to grieve. So my doctor, bless his heart, he he said that I could try X, Y, and Z, and of course I tried X, Y, and Z for three years, and finally I said, that's it. He was thrilled when I finally listened to him, and he likes to tell me, you know, you would have been a parent a lot sooner if you had listened to me and then you know I pick up my phone and I say yes but I wouldn't have these children and these are the children I'm meant to have um so yeah so the first transfer worked and um we we definitely got our twins so who are now 18 so. that's incredible and that was that with your own eggs or with an egg donor it was. I don't mind that question, actually. Um, it was. I was very, very, very lucky because, you know, I started when I was 32 and I was 40 when I became a parent. Um, so, you know, bless my heart, I really didn't even think that at 39, I was two months shy of my 40th birthday, that I couldn't use my eggs. I just, I just didn't think. And, you know, my doctor had always told me that I had um, good embryos. And I did, I, I tell my clients now, you know, lousy uterus, but great eggs. So, um, yeah, I was, I was very fortunate for that for sure. And, um, what but, but on the flip side of that, I just want to say one thing, um, you know, you get to a point and I was at that point where it didn't really even matter to me if it was my own genetics or not. I, I always say if a baby fell out of the sky and somebody said, that's my baby, it would have been my baby. Absolutely. Um, I have donor, uh, sperm donor conceived children, so um, yes. donor conception, of course, plays a huge part of Fertility Help Hub. And so bringing people these kind of life-changing options um, needs to be widely discussed so that people know what is available to them, because as, as we know from our own personal experiences, these are things that have made having a family possible. Correct. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm very interested um, and everyone watching will be excited to hear about how you can help. 
Um, so could you tell um, us a little bit more about the Surrogacy Law Center and also the work there and also Extraordinary Conceptions? Um, at what point did you decide to set it up and a bit more about the foundations? Yeah, I, I um, we uh, we had moved to San Diego, interestingly enough, and um, you know I'd taken some time off. The kids were really little, and then I was looking around um, for something to do, um, you know. And I was, um, you know, kind of having a, a little bit of a tough time, um, you know, finding a job. I'm new to the community. And uh, there were some circumstances that happened, and um, I decided, wow, this is this is something that I could really do, and I really I, I could really help people. Um, and so, you know, I I just founded the agency and the law center. Um, the surrogacy law center was always my first passion. Um, so shortly thereafter, you know, Mario took over and and definitely you know, built it up, but um, it was something that I really decided to do to help people and, you know, all over the world. And that's really what we do at, at the law office. We really help people from, you know, France to the UK, to Spain, to Italy, to Brazil. Um, and we really try to make it as easy as possible because we know that, you know, when they go to an attorney and they work with an attorney, it can be scary, right? You know, they've done all this stuff with the agency, they're at extraordinary conceptions, they're talking to their doctor, and now they say, okay, now you go meet with your attorney. And they're like, an attorney? Mm -hmm. So we, we try to make it as simple and easy as possible. Um, we have people in the office who speak Spanish, French, um, Mandarin, Chinese, um, even Farsi. Um, so, um, and then we have um, Vietnamese, so we have, uh, and Portuguese. So we have multiple languages um, to help people feel as comfortable as possible. Because I always think if I had to go work in another country and meet with a lawyer, I, and especially if I had to go um, to do surrogacy or egg donation or sperm donation or whatever, I would want to feel as comfortable as possible in working in that country. So that's why you know, I did that. And we have documents to help them. Um, you know, if they speak Spanish, you know, everything's in Spanish as much as possible in French and Mandarin. So yeah, we really do that. We really try to help as many people as possible feel comfortable. Brilliant. Thank you for that introduction. Egg donation. Tell us a little bit more about the process um, for both the egg donors and the intended parents. Absolutely. So when Stephanie asked me to join the agency, about a year after she created everything, uh, we talked a little bit and she says, look, I know that you're going to be a little bit different than how I would run it, but do the best that you can and hopefully you can help people because that is our ultimate goal. So what we do is we provide information, communication, and trust. Those are the three things that we emphasize when we work with either egg donors or clients, IPs, intended parents as we call them. We've learned a lot over the last 15 years and we emphasize in this part because honestly, when we did this ourselves, nobody really took the time to educate us or help us save time or money. So we emphasize that. As far as the egg donors, we of course advertise, we talk to the egg donors, we request information, we make sure that you know they do qualify and many times they don't, but they, we still inform them we just don't keep them in, in the black that they don't get to be an egg donor. We let them know why. And many times, of course, it's a hard decision, but we still have to do it. Communication with the clients is very important. They want to be able sometimes to connect genetically, um, something that's similar to what they, their spouse might be or what their partner might be. So again, providing pictures, providing uh, videos, all of this is important so that clients can feel connected. They can feel this is the right choice. We realize, just like when we refer different doctors, we want them to become more and more educated because then when they make the right decision, they feel very comfortable that they made the best decision. 
Absolutely. I know from um, picking a sperm donor that those are things that are so important. Um, and I'd like to find out a little bit more about the stringent vetting process because it was reassuring for me on the sperm donation side, as you're about to tell us about egg donation, to know that not anybody can donate. Um, there is obviously um, vetting that goes on um, right. to ensure and to maximize success. So what does that look like for egg donors? Well, first of all, our initial requirements is that the young lady needs to be between the ages of 18 to 29. And sometimes we can stretch it a little bit longer, but most people feel more comfortable within the, that age group. Um, they have to have a certain BMI of 27 or less, weight to high proportion. They have to be healthy. They have to be not on Depo-Provera, non-smoker, non-drugs. And then there's other things that we look for. We, we also do background checks. We do social media checks to make sure. So we're looking for as much information before we even review the information they've provided. Then once we've reviewed it, then we will go ahead and do a pre-screening for psychological evaluation. It's a very brief screening, um, just to ensure that there's nothing wrong with this young lady that you know maybe you can't find on the paperwork. And then after that, we go ahead and approve them. And then the, when they're on the database, they will will welcome them to our database and let them know that you know we will be reaching out to them as soon as somebody is interested in them. We do not discriminate against anyone, race, sex, it doesn't matter. As long as they're female, yes. And yes, we do have men that sometimes apply to be egg donors, which we still don't quite understand, but they do. Really? Gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right? I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> it's like, it's like what, what part of the biology class in the sex education did you, did you miss? Were you not there that day? Wow. We even had, I remember years ago, we had a phone call from a young lady in Arkansas, and she said, you know, my girlfriend got the car this weekend. Can we just drive down to San Diego and drop off some eggs and get the money? Like, you know, if she was a chicken or something, so. Gosh, gosh. Yeah. So what percentage would you say of egg donors who um, inquire or want to be an egg donor make it through to actually donating their eggs? Well, one of the things that's important for us is to provide as much variety for our clients as possible. So we have around 3,500 egg donors across the US, Canada, and some other countries. So we have plenty to choose from. Uh, and people have told us that sometimes it almost seems overwhelming and too much. But again, if you're going through this process, you want to be able to have plenty to choose from because you're talking about a child that's going to be with you your whole life. I would say a percentage it just depends on the race. Because we have limited of certain races, they have a higher chance of getting selected than just say uh, a Caucasian race, which because we have so many, it does become a little bit more difficult in getting chosen. Everybody chooses for different reasons. Some people choose because they have a high SAT. Some people choose because they're the same height that they want their children to be. So we don't really discriminate in what people are, are looking for. We just want to provide them with enough choice so that if for some reason it doesn't work the first time, they have a second, third, and fourth choice to come back to. Absolutely. And I guess as well, it depends on the situation, doesn't it? Whether they're, whether they're looking um, because they're needing to <clears throat> not replace, but they genetically cannot have a child. So um, there's almost that grief grieving process to go through to find the donor or whether it's um, a same-sex relationship um, looking for an egg donor, um, or, or a single man doing it, for example, then um, there, I guess there are different feelings and choices that need to be made and um, variety to help with that pool of people who need the help, um, as there is with any kind of donation. And we've seen an increase in single, single men who want to have children with on their own. They just feel that they can do it and, you know, they have family to support them. So we've seen an increase in that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. Actually, that is a good question. What are, what are the types or who are the people that you help? I would say the average has to be um, heterosexual couples 
that are in their late 40s, early 50s, that somehow time just went by, uh, they focus on their career, those are still the main source of clients that we have. Gay population also has been increasing over the years. Uh, older clients has increased over the years as well. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we do see a lot, uh, definitely a lot of a mix of clients for sure. Especially like uh, Mario said, the single men or the single women. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely have been coming um, in as well. I have to say, getting back to the donor select, uh, mm -hmm. the donor uh, criteria, you know, once a donor is selected um, off of the database, then, um, and I don't know if the audience knows, then she has to pass uh, a more stringent medical. So she goes to the physician. And each physician, and I'm not really involved in that to a really large extent, has, um, you know, standards. And then some do uh, d slightly different testing others, but they definitely have to, you know, go through stringent medical protocol. So mm -hmm. it's not easy being a donor. No. And actually, um, Extraordinary Conceptions, you've written a brilliant article for Fertility Help Hub, um, which people can read on the website, all around the process of um, egg donation, what's involved, um, and as you said, the medical checks, everything that goes into it, and advice and tips for picking a donor. So definitely one to read. Um, and you touched on it just before. Um, what what's the the egg egg donation compensation and the reimbursement? What does that look like in the U.S.? Uh, do you want me to say that? Sure. In the U in the U.S., just like most things in the U.S., it's market driven. Um, so um, you know, most of the women get paid on average, um, you know, between um, five eight thousand dollars. Of course, there's some women who get less. There's some women who get more. And they're paid for their time and their effort. So they are definitely paid for, you know, taking the medication, going to the medical appointments, undergoing the medical procedure. Because unlike, you know, sperm donation, these women have to undergo a medical procedure. Um, so that's how it is in the U.S. And, you know, like I said, the fees can vary widely. But the average is about five to $8,000. Um, in Canada and I, I believe other parts of the world, but we're just gonna talk about Canada. These women are paid expenses, so they can't receive compensation for undergoing the egg donation procedure if they are in Canada, it's expenses. And I know Canada is in the process of um, you know, defining that a bit more. So for instance, let's say you have a donor and your clinic is in Toronto and she's on the other side of the country. So she's going to be paid, you know, her reimbursed for her travel, airline, baggage, mileage, um, you know, uh, let's say, let's say um, she has a dog and she lives by herself and she, or a dog and a cat and the dog and the cat has to be kenneled or it can't be kenneled, it has to have a dog sitter, she'll get reimbursed for that. So. That's fair enough. Um, and obviously you have egg donors from all over the world. So what does that look like, the reimbursement and the compensation for people who aren't based in the US um, or in Canada? Is that similar to um, the Canadian guidelines that you just out outlined? That is correct. The, the payment depends on the country and whatever the guidelines are established by any medical organization in that specific country. Now, most of our egg donors are in the US and in Canada, probably 95% of them. So the rest is just a few here and there that um, Mexico, Europe, where they just come to the US and donate. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I'd love to talk a bit about surrogacy. Um, could you go into a bit more um, depth around the meaning and the definition of surrogacy? Because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of people when they hear the word surrogacy assume that it's traditional surrogacy um, and they assume that the surrogate is using their own egg too. So please could you talk a bit about um, surrogacy at extraordinary conceptions and gestational versus traditional? I think I'll start with the tradi tra traditional versus gestational because you're absolutely right, Eloise. Most people um, are, are somewhat confused about it. You know, it's not something that they see every day. Um, so surrogacy actually started as 
the traditional, the most famous case in the United States is the baby M case. And she was a traditional surrogate, meaning it was her genetics, her egg, and she was also carrying the child. Um, so that is how surrogacy actually started. Most of the surrogacy you see today, I would say, I don't have a percentage, but it's got to be probably 90% or 95% is gestational, meaning the woman carrying the child has absolutely no genetic link to the child that she is carrying. Mm -hmm. um, most agencies, um, people who match intended parents with surrogates and egg donors, do not um, handle traditional surrogacy. In my legal office, um, we see about one case per year um, where we do a traditional surrogacy. So the majority of our cases as well are gestational. Mm -hmm. And reason being that there's, um, I guess, some, how would you say, um, I guess that it makes it slightly more removed, doesn't it, from the surrogacy and any concerns that there might be about or myths around wanting to keep the child, it's slightly more removed, yes. isn't it? It really is. And, and there's less of a risk for um, my intended parents. And I get, especially like my gay couples, oh, my sister's friend or, you know, my, my cousin, you know, and they could save a lot of money because they don't have to have an egg donor. You know, the, the woman, you know, can donate her eggs and she can, you know, give birth to the child. So there is a risk for the intended parents because the, the court will look at this woman as the mother. So if she changes her mind, I tell all my clients, because she's traditional, she's genetically connected to that child. She could get custody, visitation, and both. You know, you would be linked with her for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so most of my clients aren't willing to take that risk, but I have to say, I actually worked on a case where it started out gestational and it just, it just didn't work. I mean, this, this, the, you know, it was the intended mother's own genetics and, you know, it just, it was not successful. And this surrogate, bless her heart, said, I'll be your traditional surrogate. I will do it for you. Yeah. And so, yes. So we got, you know, the agency involved because it was an agency match, um, a different agency than Extraordinary Conception. And we, you know, got everybody psychs, re-psych screening again, because when you do a psychological screening for a gestational surrogate, it's, it's different than mm -hmm. a traditional. Mm -hmm. And she ended up delivering a baby boy for them. Oh, what a fantastic uh, story. Yes. So, so inspirational. Um, I have a friend who spent 10 years trying to, well, she wasn't able to conceive naturally because she has uh, cystic fibrosis and she's had two oh. double lung transplants. Mm -hmm. um, and she went through surrogacy in the UK and she had to use three different surrogates before it's worked for them. They welcomed their baby boy after 10 years, a couple of months ago during lockdown. Oh. And she said, because she came on um, our podcast, she said that um, it's really her parents' generation who assume it's traditional surrogacy and, and ask whether she's genetically related to him, yeah. whereas everyone else of um, her generation knows that, um, sorry, everyone of her parents' generation assumes that the surrogate, it was the surrogate's egg, Whereas, of course, people of her generation know that times have moved on and this has been made possible with her eggs and her husband's sperm and the surrogate carried the baby. So right. she described it as the surrogate being the oven to cook a roast yes. chicken and then the end of nine months, out he came. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that brings me on to the next question. I think that there, there are a lot of myths around it. What would you say about surrogacy in the movies versus reality? Well, one of the things that in the movies, they always show parents involved in every step of the way, physically. This is not always the case. And especially for us, which we have such a huge international base of clients, many of them cannot be there. Additionally, too, some clients, because of different cultures, want to not be totally involved. And as I talk to my clients, um, we tell them, look, we want you to be 
a part of their lives, but not totally into their lives, because then it can become very frustrated, frustrating for the surrogates. And so they, once we tell them that, they quite understand. In the movies, they don't show that. They just show somebody constantly being there, creating some drama. The other thing that's very important is at the end of the movie, you know, they show the surrogate having sometimes strong feelings of bond. Whereas in reality, what happens is once the baby is born, the surrogate holds the baby and says, wow, what a beautiful baby. Here's your baby, have a good life. And maybe a, a postcard will be exchanged for Christmas, but pretty much that's it. That's really the reality versus what they show in, in the movies. That's, yeah, that's probably very reassuring for people to hear because I presume with your club, well, with your intended parents, there are some who want to have a relationship with the surrogate and some who perhaps don't. I guess it depends on the personalities and, and the fit. Is that right? Uh, Absolutely. There are some women that are just so scared that they don't even want to communicate with the surrogate because they're already so used to failure that they're afraid something's going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And then there's other clients that are monitoring the surrogate on Facebook and saying, oh my God, is she drinking fresh orange juice or frozen orange juice? So you have the extremes and we have to find the right balance. And that's why we have um, access to uh, therapists, three therapists who do an amazing job with the clients and with the surrogates during this whole process. There's some surrogates that get very little support from their clients. So we're there to pat the surrogate on the back all the time and say, great job, you're doing great, communicating with them all the time. We have groups. And then there's those surrogates that say, can you please stop telling the clients to stop uh, texting me at three in the morning because they're in Europe. You know, they're really just overwhelming. So you have to find the right balance. And that's why we always talk to the clients first and say, what type of surrogate are you looking for? Are you looking to be really involved or are you looking to have a distance? And then we will try to accommodate them for what they're looking for. And how often would you say the match works out? Have you ever had situations where, um, you might need to rethink a match or do, would you say that predominantly um, they're well suited and things go quite smoothly? Well, you know, Eloise, we've been in business for 15 years and when we first started, it wasn't always the right thing, but we've learned so much over the years. Yeah. And that's why we have our own therapists that are, do pre-screenings now, the surrogates, to give us a better idea of what they're going to be like so that we can do better matching in the beginning. Then we have clients that become unrealistic during the process. The women can get jealous, hormones kick in, the surrogate can get mad. So yes, but once I get involved, then I try to bring peace to the group if there's issues. As a matter of fact, we have a policy at the office that if it doesn't matter if the surrogate was the one that made the mistake or the client made the mistake, I'm always gonna take the blame because at the end of the day, I want them to have a good relationship even if they don't feel like um, talking to each other, it doesn't matter. They can blame me as much as they want because when she's there, I want her to, I want that surrogate to be willingly and happy to give up the baby to the clients. We've only had one instance where it, it was an extreme case and we had to have a, a nurse bring the baby out to the parking lot because they just did not like each other. Well, we learned a lot from that one instance. So things can change, but so far we've been doing really good the last seven, eight years. Well, one instance in 15 years, that's exceptional. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then you, you're, the audience has to understand that um, even though the agency had to bring the baby out to the parking lot, the parents were still legally the parents at that moment. We yes. typically get a judgment of parentage before the birth. So the second that baby's born, the hospital looks to the parents, um, you know, for the care and control of that child. Um, they get the identification bracelets, you know, and, you know, Mario's correct, all my surrogates, you know, they just, oh, look what I did. Now here, mom and dad, or here, dad and dad. Yes, I'm going to go take a big nap for the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Yeah. It's great to see how an agency can help, sh can obviously hugely help with the process, with the emotional side, um, also from an, a law perspective, which we're gonna come in onto in a minute. 
um, to really shape that experience and also to handhold and to guide people through something that is obviously a very emotionally led and um, thing that they may never have imagined that they would be doing. Um, so to have experts guiding that process is really a rather brilliant thing. Um, and having a wealth of experience only adds to that feeling of security. I can imagine for the intended parents and the surrogates. It's very important to have the mental health side, I have to say, because I'm not a psychologist. You know, when I have um, cases that are independent, they don't have an agency, they don't have a support, um, they come to my office. And, you know, there's, there's, I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I, 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 you know, I can help you with your contract, your parentage order. I've got you if you have a legal issue. So I really appreciate my office does when they've got, you know, the support that they need because it is, it, it's a, it's a journey and it's, it's definitely, it's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about so many pros to surrogacy, um, to working with a surrogate. Are there any cons? Like, is there any reason why people wouldn't choose to use this route if they're having, needing? Um, I think uh, for some people, um, it could be financial. Right. Um, I think a lot of people feel, and I know when I was going through my infertility struggle, I can't tell you how many times, Eloise, I heard people say, well, why don't you just adopt? And I know for uh, people outside of the United States, adoption is a, can be a much more difficult process. And I think people in the United States don't understand how difficult it is in the United States mm -hmm. and how expensive it can be as well. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so some people, it is less expensive, it can be. So some people just feel that the adoption is the route for them. Um, and I, I think also a lot of people might feel that the surrogacy option is a traditional surrogacy, you know, right? Like most people feel that it, it's, it's not as well thought out as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, you know, support from physicians and agencies and uh, mental health professionals and attorneys. Um, as I always tell, you know, my surrogates and my parents, it's a village and you have the support. And I think, I think a lot of people don't realize that, that it, it really can be um, such a wonderful thing uh, for everybody involved when it's done right. Sure. And um, a, a question that has come to mind, um, how long approximately would the matching process take? Well, the matching process will, can be as short as three months. Wow. Or, yes, it can be three months because we have 3,500 egg donors in our database. Generally, during any day, we have between 80 to 100 surrogates all over the U.S. and in Canada and now Mexico. So their surrogates are plenty. So what it is, is what the clients are looking for. That is more difficult. So they might take a month, two months, three months, six months. We've had some people work with us up to two, three years because they just couldn't find the perfect surrogate. And that's just the reality that some people are looking for a surrogate that looks like a model without realizing that the outside is not as important as the inside. But you know, that's their culture. We have to respect their culture. So it, it just depends on the person. Mm -hmm. and some clients come to me and say, Mario, I want a baby. I want two, pick a surrogate. I don't care. When they tell me to pick an egg donor for them, I say, I do care and I'm not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But years ago, some clients insisted. So I would send them 10 pictures of, of egg donors and then they could pick one or two amongst them. And that's what we did. But nowadays that doesn't happen anymore. But yes, it's not that hard as long as you're not too picky. Okay. And, and I'm sure there are lots of people who, as, as you both have experienced personally, they've been through the ringer and they want yeah. to, they want to have a child. Um, they don't want to wait anymore. They want to get the process started. They want to take a baby at home at the end of it. So I'm sure, you know, it's music to their ears to hear that you can help them get those wheels in motion and it's might be the closest they've got to doing that. 
Yes, it is. And we've had some people say, I want to start tomorrow. And that's says, okay. Who's yeah. your doctor? Okay, my doctor is so-and-so. Okay, your doctor's backlogged for three, six months. I Would you consider changing doctors? Uh, I've been with them for so long. Okay, now you have to deal with him before you can deal with me because you want to move tomorrow, but they're backlogged. So, and there's some also doctors that have more strict requirements for the surrogates uh, because it's not because they don't believe they can get her pregnant. It's because their success rates are very important. So they don't want failures, you know, so they want the perfect surrogates for their clients and they put all that on the agencies to try to find the perfect surrogates. But you know, it's very rare now to get women that are surrogates that have no C-section. Mm-hmm. Because hospitals are just setting up all women that are pregnant to have C-sections so they can save time and money as well. So, you know, it, it, it's just depending on many factors, not just one factor. And so you obviously work with a huge range of fertility clinics. Um, if, if a um, couple or a woman is already with a clinic, um, are you able to work with the clinic that they are at or do they move clinics? No, we work with 98% of what the clinics that people come with. There's only a few clinics that I know personally that they're not very successful or they do things that are not ethical. And usually I'll find a very soft approach on seeing if they will consider an alternative. But generally speaking, we work with the clinics that clients will come to us with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about um, surrogacy law with you, Stephanie. Um, before we move on to that, I want to speak a little bit about the surrogacy costs because we have touched on it. Um, and I know that at Extraordinary Conceptions, you're doing wonderful things um, with your team who are working um, across the world uh, to give and to deliver options that are more affordable for people in other countries um, Mm -hmm. to make this a reality. Um, So, and and also um, for people who are perhaps at clinics in Europe to be able to um, have treatment closer to home. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, the programs and the cost-effective options that you offer um, and, and how you're able to make this a more accessible and affordable process worldwide? So one of the things that has been important for me is to establish partners around the world in different places. So in the last 10 years, uh, Stephanie and I have traveled to different countries to visit their IVF centers, to talk to doctors, you know, from the UK to Cyprus, to Prague, to Greece, to China, to Saipan, to many different places. I've been to Thailand as well. And the things that are interesting to me is to see the IVF centers, to see the clinics, but to know and find out what the laws are. And that's why we have never really referred anybody to an IVF center in another country where I know that they're constantly emailing me saying, hey, listen, if you send me clients, this is what my fees are. You can add on 5, 10, 15, 20,000 as much as you want for yourself. We don't work that way. Mm -hmm. We just refuse to work that way. When you read that all these uh, Spanish couples were stuck in in Ukraine because of passport and and legal issues, when you read what happens in India and other countries, um, you know, you just, I don't have a heart for that. I'd rather supply what EC Extraordinary Conceptions can do. We're not referring clients to other countries. We're doing the work in other countries because we're going to follow our policies, operations, standard operations, we're going to do it the right way. That's really important for us. So now what we have is we have surrogacy in Canada, US, and Mexico. We just started this year, which is our lowest cost program. We made sure legally, it took me almost a year to get this done right in Mexico, and we're still doing the work in the US, but now we have people in Mexico, just like I have in Canada. We're working with a partner IVF center in the UK where clients can go to the UK and create the embryos and we'll send the American, Canadian, or Mexican surrogate there for the embryo transfer. We're also working in um, Saipan for an Asian community that wants to go to Saipan, which is a three hour flight from China. So we're looking for opportunities in different parts of the world 
and we call it a hybrid program where you can just use a surrogate from a different country, lower your costs, and still get high quality medical services. That's really important. And look, by lowering the cost because of less travel? No, you're lowering the cost because IVF centers in the U.S. are the most expensive, probably around the world. Surrogates in the U.S. charge more than surrogates in other countries as well. So there's many factors to lowering the cost um, so that it's not 150000 like in the U.S. on average, you know. Mm -hmm. Canada, Mexico, it's under 100000 And, you know, if we combine that with going to the U.K., which, again, IVF in the U.K. is not as expensive as the U.S., then, yes, you're saving tens, twenties, thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we were actually due to do this meet in person for this interview. But sadly, because of the situation mm -hmm. we find ourselves in, um, we're doing it as everyone is virtually. Um, mm -hmm. So you were due to be in London um, shortly, weren't you? Yes, we were. We were. We should have. All, normally, I go to Europe and Asia three times a year with Stephanie sometimes also goes <laughs> alternating with me. We go to conferences. In September, we're supposed to be there to Paris, to Belgium, to London, and to Cologne, uh, Germany, for conferences. We might not be able to go, but because we have staff in Europe, if they're still going to have the conferences, they will be able to go. As a matter of fact, today I was reading, it was still not, we're still not allowed in uh, Europe as Americans. So, mm, yeah. yeah. I don't think we're allowed into America either. No. No. <laughs> we're 14 day quarantine period in the UK if you do travel to the UK. Exactly, exactly. And hopefully by Christmas time, these travel restrictions will have lifted, fingers crossed. Hopefully, yes. Um, so so that, that leads me on nicely to ask, what, so what are the pros and cons with um, the differences in costs in terms of why people would go to North America for, exp for more expensive treatment versus cheaper countries like Greece and Ukraine? And, and um, also, what does that mean from a legal standpoint? Well, I'll go first, but you know, when you say cheaper costs, yes, and you know, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And some of the clinics and some of the countries that I visited, and I look at their equipment, how old it is, and I look at the quality and the success rate. For instance, um, we had an egg donor travel to one of these countries years ago, and these were experienced girls. There was two of them. And they called me like a week into the injections, and they said, we're really confused. We normally take double or triple of the amount of injections that they're giving us, you know, to stimulate us. So we don't know what's going on here. So it turned out that in this country, they would understimulate the girls because they only wanted them to produce three to five eggs to produce maybe one or two embryos because they didn't want to freeze anything for the clients if there was anything left over. They just wanted them to buy into another program if they didn't get pregnant. And so you see things like this, that just because the cost is cheap in the short run, the success rate of the facility is lower. Uh, they don't have the best facilities, the best embryologists. Mm -hmm. So again, you're getting what you paid for. Whereas here, yes, you're paying more, but the success rates are almost 90% with egg donation and surrogacy. Uh, you're getting facilities that you can trust and believe. I went to an IVF center in one country in Europe years ago, and we talked about egg donors, and um, I, they showed me all their information, and they were proud to show me the little bit of information about the egg donor, and then I said, aren't those egg donors out there, those young ladies, are they prospective egg donors? And, I, and the doctor said, yes, they are, and they get paid 500 euros. I said, oh, okay, so, but one of them looked like a gypsy. He says, yeah, we get a lot of gypsies. Again, you're, you're, you don't know what you're getting many times, whereas here, people just feel more comfortable with the fact whether it's here or the UK as well, you know, it would be great. So you get what you pay for mm -hmm. in many. Absolutely. I had, uh, my husband and I had our treatment in America um, and it was first class. Yes. Um, obviously costs can be higher and what we, we went for what we needed on, on a male um, fertility perspective, but, um, it's it's interesting to hear 
<laughs> about those kinds of stories because I think people need to do their research and people need to be educated about, um, as you said, um, the quality that you're receiving. Yeah. When you're wearing and then also, also legally, um, in other parts of the world, um, the surrogate is still looked on as, uh, you know, the mother. Whereas in the United States, another reason why people come here is because the laws are very favorable. Um, so, you know, as long as you have a contract, it's notarized, um, then we do the, the court process, the parentage order, the intended parents feel very secure that, you know, they are looked at as the parents. And that's really important. Absolutely. Um, how do the surrogacy laws differ by state? Obviously, there are so many states in America, it's, it's difficult yeah. to give one answer for that. But um, specifically in California, and obviously with things changing in New York as well, um, what does it look like from state to state? The trend is definitely much more favorable. Um, so um, it's, you know, looked on as, as, lo as long as you have a sound process, you have a contract that was entered into before the surrogate started her medical procedure. Um, and then you uh, typically go through a court process when the surrogate is pregnant. Um, so then the intended parents are legally the parents, the surrogate and, and her spouse are not and there's you know typically no adoption process necessary and that is the trend that is what we're seeing across the united states um there still are some states where they won't allow you to enter into a surrogacy agreement if one of the partners or um or actually i'm sorry both of the partners are not genetically connected so let's say you know i come in and i can't you you know my eggs aren't good right and then I'm heterosexual, I have a spouse, his sperm isn't good, we need an egg donor and a sperm donor. Yes, you can do that procedure in California and you will be, be declared the parents in California. Whereas some states like Florida, for instance, that doesn't work, you can't. So you want, somebody needs to be genetic, genetically connected. And then Utah, you have to be married. So in California, you don't have to be married, but in the state of Utah and there's some other states, you have to be married. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the trend is definitely very positive, but there are still some states where there's, you know, a little bit of... And New York seems to have been quite backwards with um, the laws around surrogacy. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to change. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, why do people need to um, use a lawyer during this process? And, and what happens with the um, assuming of rights and, and legal rights to the child, their child? Well, the short answer is, is that um, the cases that you hear about in the news are the ones where uh, the couple and the surrogate did not work with an attorney. So right. uh, it's very important. Yes, most of those kids, they just pulled a contract off the internet and they signed it. Um, you, yeah, you can't do that in California. In California, you have to be represented by an attorney. And if I represent you, you're going to be a surrogate. Um, somebody else represents the parent. So that, and that actually, you know, most of the laws that are being formed now, that's, that's the way that they're going. It's definitely very safe. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, you know, your role, the surrogate knows hers. She knows what's expected of her under the contract. She's had her own attorney. You as that parent, you had your own attorney explain to you the contract, your role, your rights, your obligations and your duties. So it's very, very important. Um, when I was going through this process with my husband, we absolutely had our own attorney and we had a contract. So it's very important that you, you definitely want to have a contract. And what, and happens, want to have legal representation. Hmm? what happens legally once the child is born? So uh, once the child is born, <coughs> if you're able to get a judgment. Um, for instance, I'm in California. I get a judgment. I typically get it two to three months before the child's born. Then the moment that child is born, um, the parents are legally the parents of that child. It's as if they gave birth to their own child. So they get the bracelet, um, the hospital, you know, looks to them as the parents, 
talks to them directly about uh, their child and the care and what the child needs. Um, so, you know, they are looked on as if they gave birth, which is wonderful. And most of my clients, even now, uh, especially what's going on, they get admitted into the hospital where their child does, and they get to stay with their child, you know, right away while the surrogate takes a well-deserved nap. So, Absolutely. and rest. Yeah. Well, she, and it's different legally in the UK, isn't it, once the child's born in terms of assuming the rights and the birth certificate? Yeah, because the surrogate is legally has all the rights and if and if she decides that she wants to to keep that child, she can. Mm -hmm. That that's that's I see why people in the UK would would work in the UK. Um, cuz it's difficult. It's difficult and expensive to go outside your home country. Um, but I know working from, with my parents, my intended parents, it's very scary for them, you know, that feeling. They, the question they ask me is, so can the surrogate change her mind? And I'm like, no, <laughs> she's not going to change her mind. And even if she did, you have a contract that says you're the intended parents. Under California, once that contract is signed and notarized, my parents are looked on as the parents of this child. Mm -hmm. And then I tell them, listen, the surrogate has been screened by the agency thoroughly. It's probably 45 minutes. Um, she's met with the doctor, his staff uh, for hours. She's had tests. She's met with a mental health professional. They, they, they run a battery of tests. They wanna make sure that she's thought about this, that she's got the support system. Um, you know, and then she goes through a contract and she meets with her own attorney. I said, the surrogate wants to give you your child. She does not want, she doesn't look at this as her child. She wants to, you know, do a wonderful thing at the hospital, help, see that baby, you know, hold that. Our surrogate fed our child. She was one of the first people to feed one of them. I can't remember which one. It's been a long time. Um, but she slept, you know, she, she was there uh, nearly 48 hours. I, I didn't see her. She didn't, she didn't want my children. She had her own children. She wants to go back to her life and get pictures and get sent pictures and see them grow. And, you know, my surrogate was thrilled to see their high school graduation pictures. And then she thought, oh my gosh, it's been that long. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but that's what they want. You know, that's, that's why it's really important to work with a good agency to have all the checks and balances in place. So that at the end of the day, we want everything to run as smoothly as possible. A hundred percent. And do the surrogates get concerned that the intended parents might pull out? That actually happens more often than what people think. Um, I, ha I don't think it, ha it happens too often any longer because there's just the agencies have gotten better at this mm -hmm. um my surrogates aren't concerned about that um I, I typically work with really good agencies um i had it potentially happen to me i think about 10 years ago and it was an agency um that you know went under and um you know the intended parents, you know, lost their money. Um, you know, they, so it was just definitely a very difficult time for everybody. At the end of the day, the intended parents, you know, came back at the eighth month. They said, we were just, you know, very upset. Um, so we're so sorry. Of course we want our baby. Um, so it all worked out in the end. But I, I think now with, all, you know, a lot of the checks and balances in place, you know, the attorneys involved in the agencies, it, it, I haven't heard it happening as much as, as it, did before and it's a very small percentage but you're right that's a good question because most people do believe it's surrogate who runs off with the baby yeah, and I'm like I know. no 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 it's the parents that abandon the surrogacy we actually did um, a quiz with um, you guys on Facility Help Hub all about dispelling the myths um, and the misconceptions around surrogacy and that was one of the ones that came up. So people should definitely go and check out that quiz. Um, and then just to finish, I wanted to sort of find out a bit more about how you're operating in this COVID era, how things are moving forward, what your advice would be to people who are thinking about this process and this route. Um, and really how your agency stands above others um, out there and, and the values that you have, which you touched on at the beginning of our chat, um, to really inform people about 
what they need to think about if they're starting out, especially during this COVID time? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit first about the values, because I think that's one of the things that helps us stand out amongst other people. And first of all, of course, because we're, we're a team, Stephanie does the law. We're not in the same build, same office or anything, but she handles the law, whereas I handle the agency. And if there's an issue, I just walk to her office. I don't have to wait for a phone call back from a lawyer. And this really helps eliminate time because we do everything. We have the therapist, we have the legal, we have, um, soon we're even gonna be involved in insurance aspect of it as well, because that's very important with medical insurance. But as far as what makes us stand out is our, our values, because I never forgot the first time my little daughter grabbed my hand and looked at me and said, Daddy, I love you so much. It's like, oh my God, I just warmed my heart and made me feel incredible. And at that moment, I said, every person in this world deserves the love of a child. I don't care who you are, single, straight, gay, trans, older, younger, everybody deserves the love. And we started to change and evolve way back then so that we have free policy. We have the stress-free policy, which means we work for free in the beginning. Clients sign up on our database. They get to talk to us, work with us. We request no money, no signatures nothing until they find an egg donor or a surrogate or both. And then we've sent all the medical records to the IVF center. They've been pre-approved and they're ready to go. Only until then are, do they have to, then at that point they will send in a certain amount of money to start and sign all the documentation to work with us as an agency. So we're working for free, but what we're really doing is building trust between the clients and us. And so they can see that we're in this with them. The second policy we have is the safe single agency fee experience, which means we only charge our agency fee once, a donation or surrogacy. So that means again, so if they're not successful and the doctor says you need a different surrogate, we will provide another surrogate and that is not a problem. Um, we will keep providing surrogates up to seven years until they find success. Of course, nobody's made it past three years, but again, they see that we really care and we're in it with them for the long run. Egg donation or surrogacy. Because of these two policies, people love working with us. The doctors love working with us because they can see that we're in it for the best well-being of the clients and they like being partners with us. So Stephanie and I are well known amongst the doctors and many of them are partners with us because they love our ethics and our policies and that's what makes us stand out amongst others. Brilliant, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. Stephanie, was there anything else that you wanted to add to that? I know during time it's been um, you know, a, a little bit stressful for everybody involved. As you can see, we are definitely working. We may all be working distantly and remotely, but we definitely are working. Um, and um, for our clients, um, you know, we definitely are helping them with their contracts and their parentage orders. Things are just taking a little bit longer right now. Um, people definitely still do want to move forward with egg donation and surrogacy. Um, we work with the physicians, they carefully screen, and in our contracts, um, I just actually met with um, a prospective couple yesterday, um, and uh, they're looking for an attorney, and um, she asked me, you know, have you added, and I said, absolutely, we had actually had to add, you know, additional safeguards in, because, you know, we want everybody to be, you know, especially very careful right now. Um, you know, so we definitely are, you know, keeping us on our toes. But, you know, during this time we are working and, um, you know, we're here for our clients, you know, no matter if they're in the contract phase or, you know, they're trying to get in, uh, you know, for our international clients and then we help them get out of the country. Um, so, yeah, we, we really are looking forward to helping as many people as possible. Have a baby. And tell Louise, as far as the agency is concerned, we, um, with the COVID crisis, we haven't laid off anybody. I have 42 employees and everybody's still working from home because there's still a lot of work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, clients are still asking us questions. There's a lot of clients that are just waiting for the borders to open. And then all the IVF centers are gonna have a, a 
a, a, a big influx of people coming. Uh, we've talked to doctors about this as well. So, but people can get started. People can do everything remotely right now. Look at egg donors, look at surrogates, interview surrogates. We could start all the paperwork, send the medical records. The IVF centers are working. They're just in low power mode right now because they don't have the clients, but they're still working. Everybody is just ready and waiting for the travel just to come in. People don't even have to come in. They can go to several IVF centers that will even send the sperm to the U.S. Yeah. Right so processes can start. So it's just dependent on travel. But we're, we've done as much protection as we can. Uh, I'd rather have my employees safer at home than in the office under all the plastic guards and everything, only because California changed recently and where we're probably getting worse instead of better. But um, we're going to continue. Yeah, brilliant. And I, I'd say the change, the change I did see and, um, is that um, parents are moving clinics because they don't want their donor to travel. So they're switching. Yeah, that is what they're doing. Okay. So. Okay. so it kind of depends where people are located. And yeah, where's, where's my surrogate located? Where's my donor located? And I'm going to move my clinic, even though I love you, dear doctor. I don't want my surrogate to travel. Or I don't want my donor to travel. Mm -hmm. So I'll create my embryos. I have a client in Florida, but I'm going to transfer them to my clinic in Chicago. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. I see. Um, and for people wanting to find out more and get in touch, um, there is a link um, which is on the description to this interview, um, or they can reach you directly. And you've got a wonderful team of representatives around the world as well. Um, so is there anything else that you wanted to finish with? Um, any words of wisdom or advice for people thinking about this option or opportunity? Well, uh, the only thing is that no matter what the situation, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And the light has gotten bigger over the years, much bigger. So if somebody is not sure and they just want to talk, I will be happy to talk to them for free, give them options, educate them is my favorite word, not sell them, educate them so they make the right choice. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for I your know it, I know it's tough to wait um and i and i know that you know you know ivf has started up but as, as mario said they're in low power mode mm -hmm. but i i tell my clients listen it took me a long time to realize this but if you really 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 want to become a parent you will be one it may not be the way you thought it was going to be or it may not be when you thought it would be but you can be a parent Absolutely. I think that's a really good takeaway message. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time, your expertise, you. and the very informative um, things that you have uh, educated us on today. So thank you so much.